Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. I do welcome you to our worship service. And uh, I hope you would enjoy and be encouraged in your Christian journey. Let us pray. Let us come from our everyday and our routine and meet with God, the one who made us and who gave us our daily bread through the week that has just gone. Come, Lord, and be close as we worship. May we take heart the words we hear. Mean with all our hearts the words we say and pray with all our hearts for those in need. Be with us, Father. Loving God, thank you that we meet us where we are, in the middle and in the middle of our daily task. Help us to hear your call, to recognize your voice, and to respond to your invitation. To be with you now. God, we want to thank you. We want to acknowledge your presence. Be with us, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Morning, morning, and I uh, hope you're having a blessed week. Uh, lovely rain and everything's going well. As, as Johnson mentioned, I'll be uh, reading from Mark 1, uh, 14 to 20, and it's about Jesus' ministry in Galilee. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left the nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And, uh, yeah, so we get Johnson back to hear his message. It's going to be a good one because it's about fishermen. Um, we'll see what he's got to talk about. Thanks, Johnson. Thank you for the reading of the word, Brother Ben. Uh, today, uh, I've decided to share with you on a theme, the adventure of discipleship. The adventure of discipleship. Today's gospel is about Jesus calling of his first four disciples. It is about the first people who were called to hold the job which we hold today. Mark's story is not very elaborate. It is short and to the point. There is certain note of adventure as the four men leave their fishing business to go with Jesus. But there's not much in the story that seems terribly upsetting. What the story doesn't tell us about is that what those men were getting in for by becoming followers of Jesus. So to find out what was real in store for them, we have to keep reading. And what we discover is that being a disciple was not glamorous. In fact, it was downright dangerous. So later in Mark 8 verse 35, we hear Jesus saying, whoever loses his life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will find it. Matthew 10 verse 34 includes another comment. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. There are disturbing statements, especially for those of us who are today's disciples. He was saying that being his disciple is not an easy task. He was saying that the gospel is a disturbing force in the world which can upset individuals and nations alike. It brings change and new experiences to all we hear. It. Being his disciple will not be easy because the task of the, the disciple is to be the bearer of this revolutionary gospel message which changes the world. So we know what happened to Jesus. His message deceived those in power and they tried to silence him. Even John the Baptist said the same thing and his head was put on the plate. 
Of the four men in this gospel text, three were also executed for their witness. So the powers that ruled the ancient world were upset by the gospel and they tried to silence his voices. I would like to be able to say this all ancient history, but there are still governments today which oppose the gospel. The Evangelical Fellowship of India recorded 327 instances of discrimination and targeted violence against Christians in India in 2020, include five murderers, at least six churches burnt or destroyed, and 26 incidents of social boycotting, according to its early report published on 14 January 2021. A 16-year-old Pakistan Christian girl, brutally raped by a gang of Muslim robbers because of her faith, acted selflessly to save her young sister from sexual attack. That is a report from 12 January 2021. At least 24 people were killed and over 20 abdicates and a church burned and a pastor kidnapped by jihad militants during two attacks on Christmas Eve in Bono. Adawana states in Nigeria. On 24 December, armed militants raided the predominant prison village of Pemi near Chibok in Bono State on trucks and motorcycles, firing on villages, killing 11 people and setting fire to buildings, according to local reports on 5 January 2021. It is important for us to realize that the truth of the gospel is like a two-edged sword. It is both comforting and disturbing. So the messengers of this gospel may find themselves similarly regarded by those who don't want to hear that message. Even in countries where Christianity is protected by law. But there are people who don't want to hear that message. And they will try to disturb it by all means. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double aged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Hebrews 4 verse 12. That is what the word of God is like. So Jesus, to age this word, also strike close home. I wonder what Peter's mother-in-law and wife had to say about his chasing off with an itinerant preacher following Jesus Christ, leaving the wife behind and maybe children. I wonder how old men Zebedee failed when his two sons simply picked up and left their half-mended nets in the boat and followed Jesus. I suspect that the family relatives in this story were not too pleased. But that too is the nature of the gospel. It can upset individuals and disturb even family relationships. Jesus' call to save can be a call that provokes controversy and difficulty. I understand sometimes when ministers of the gospel take their stand to say they want to follow Christ, I think it's a lot of challenge, not only to, to themselves, but also to their family members. They think you are crazy because you are not really a, a man. A man has to think critically for you to become a pastor. I think of a man named Hans Luther, Martin's father. He had dreams that his illustrious son practice of law would be the means of pulling their family up from their humble origins and hence, and hence probably had dreams of his son standing before the kings. And Martin did stand before kings, but it was an outlaw, not as a champion. I think of a prospective member who told me, I would like to join your church, but I have to live with my wife and she will have none of that. I guess all I have to wait a while. Jesus points us to the reality that the gospel can be disturbing, both on a worldwide basis and as close home and family. Why? The answer lies in the power of the gospel to change people's lives. Once we meet Jesus Christ on the road of our own individual life, we'll be changed. We'll be different people. I don't know about you, but my nature is that I tend to resist to change. I suspect that many people see the gospel through rose-colored glasses, wanting to see only joy, comfort, and light, and not wanting to see the difficult or disruptive of the gospel. Behold, I make all things new, said Jesus. That's the other side of the two-edged sword. There are two important ways in this morning's gospel. 
One of which is the word repent. Too many folks think repent means to feel sorry for what you have done and then do it again. That's not it at all. Repent means to change direction. It means a change in priorities. It means living with a whole new approach to life. While I do feel that the church can serve as an anchor in a world where everything else is changing so rapidly, that is only one side of the gospel. The other side calls us to embrace the newness and change which is being brought by Jesus Christ in our life. So the second key word is belief. That doesn't mean listing your denomination as Lutheran, Methodist, United Church, Roman Catholic, and so on, on some application blank paper. It means trust and reliance and blessing one's, one's whole life in God's hands, regardless of what happens in life. Sometimes I go to the hospital. I find that there are some people who, are, who even belong to the other the United Church who I do not even know. Because when they go into the hospital, maybe sometimes they ask me, and they write down, I belong to the United Church, which they never belong to. I don't know them. It's called the leap of faith. That's the kind of change which the gospel produces. That's what makes us different. There is no turning back because it's different that we want to go away. The word of God needs to change us from within. So to be sure, we always experience the power of sin in our daily lives. We may even go as far as renouncing the Christ who brought us to faith. One of the people who did that was Peter. He knew about that for he was the one who denied he ever knew Jesus Christ because he was facing challenges. He was facing death. But later that, he went out and wept bitterly. So the change was there. He couldn't turn back. He was changed by the power of the gospel that left an inedible mark upon his soul. And he knew that he believed in this man. He knew that his faith is anchored in him. Being a disciple is a real blessing, despite the gospel's two ages. We know that God has promised to be with us always. So we are not afraid because God is always with us. That means that we are never alone in life. We have got someone who moves with us, no matter how we may feel at an any given moment. Jesus is with us. How unsettling life changes may seem to be. Jesus is with us. Being a disciple means that God is not just a Sunday friend, but a daily companion, someone who moves with us on every day in our life. It means that all things do indeed work together for good for all those who love him. Or it doesn't guarantee that we don't get the flu. It doesn't guarantee that we don't get COVID-19 or have to face unpleasant experiences. What it says is that Jesus, while we face all these unpleasant conditions, Jesus is still with us. So it doesn't mean that as God's person, God will take the events of our life and turn them toward the good. Even though we may not be able to see that good at that moment. Being a disciple also means that we will be part of the greatest change of all. The time when God will change his age into the age of eternity. And that's the time we are also waiting. So the death and resurrection of Christ sends at the center of our faith. Because we know that our mortal nature will be changed into an immortal nature. And we shall be changed one final time and be just like him. So the gospel is a great power. It does shake nations. It does disturb lives. It does change lives. But above all, it gives new life, both for today and for eternity. That's why people don't want to hear the word of God, because when they listen to it, it changes their lives. The moment you give in to listen to it, the word of God, it will change your life, and you will never be the same. That is what it is meant to. However, because the gospel cha does change people, we sometimes are tempted to hide it in its way of comfort, rather than embrace the new life to which it calls. We want to talk about it, but we don't want it to be part of our lives. We don't want to embrace what it is calling for change. We want to have faith in God, but we don't want to repent from anything. And I'm saying, God is calling us so that we hear the word of God. And when we hear the word of God, we change our lives. And we have faith in God. If we are arrested for being a Christian, would you be convicted? 
If you were arrested for being a Christian, would you be convicted? We are today's disciples, and it's not an easy task. Thankful, our Lord Jesus gives us the strength to do the job which he has given us. The big question is, what kind of a disciple will you be? What kind of a disciple are you? Jesus too calls for trustworthy, teachable, and task-oriented person to be his disciples. In turn, he promised to be our model, our mentor, and our manager. The covenant is the secret for winning the world. Are you really a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you really geared to win the world for Christ? Someone who is geared to go out and win the world for Christ. Someone who is there, wherever he's called. You are the disciple of Jesus Christ. You are there. So every one of us who is listening to this message, every one of us who is a Christian, you are the disciple I'm talking to. Are you really a committed disciple of Jesus Christ? Who is eager to spread the word of God? Who is not afraid of what people say? Because Christ is always with you. You are not on your own. And the words you speak, they are not your words. They are Jesus Christ's words. So when people blame you, when people accuse you, they are not accusing you because the words that you speak are not yours. They are Jesus Christ's words. We don't speak our own philosophy. We don't speak our own psychology. We speak the word of God. The word of God. And that's why I say the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, it is the gospel of the kingdom that we are preaching on. And I'm saying, brothers and sisters, let us preach the gospel of the kingdom and nothing else. And you see what the world is going to be. It will never be the same place. The world will change because we are now preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's not our gospel. So I'm just urging you to stand up as disciples of Jesus Christ who are geared to preach the gospel of the kingdom. May God bless you all from now and evermore. Amen. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, once John was arrested, you knew the time was right for you to step up and preach with agents. Forgive us when we hold back from what we know and we are called to, and grant us courage, humility, and trust, and awareness of your presence within us in all we do and say, so that we are not afraid but able to stand up and preach the gospel of the kingdom. This gospel we are preaching is the gospel of the kingdom, is the gospel of eternity. So be with us, Father. Bless us from now and evermore. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I all call you and I urge you to say it's time for us to give our offerings. Wherever you are, if you all feel obliged to support and give to the ministry of the kingdom, it's not our ministry, it's not about us, but it's the ministry of the kingdom, if you feel that you are obliged to do that, please, it's time to hold your offering so that I can pray for it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings before you. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity that you've given us. We really feel that we are part and parcel of the gospel of the kingdom. We are the disciples they have been called to preach. So as we stand up right now with our offerings, we are saying forward, onward, with the gospel of the kingdom. We thank you for every blessing that you have given us. Father, we bring our offerings as a thanksgiving. Thank you for everything that you have given us. May you bless it now, from now and evermore. Amen. Let us receive grace. Loving God, thank you that we meet us where we are, in the middle and mud of our day lives. Father, help us to hear your voice. Let us be able to use our time wisely, being able to leave behind those things that weigh you, you down. Face each new day courageously, and be blessed in all you do and say in Jesus' name. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.